So remember back in January when I was sitting at my kitchen table and I talked through the process of um, create how I create a new garden and how I design a new garden, even though I'm not a designer and I don't have a design background. Well, many of you commented at the time that you'd like to follow the process of this garden. So we are going to do that, um, but we're really at the next stage that I can show you first now at the end of May. Um, I will tell you at the end of the video a little bit of an update about where this garden is at and what's been happening with it. But today we're gonna talk about the plants that are going in it. So first of all, I have a post up on the blog with more information about each of the plants that's going in there. So look, I will put a link to that in the description. Head over there for all the zone details and all of those things because it's a lot of plants and it's a lot of cards to put up on the screen. So it's, I think, easier to go there. But I live in zone five. All of these plants that I'm showing you are hardy to zone five, at least most of them are hardy to four and many of them are hardy to zone three. So a lot of these plants are quite cold hardy. So um, this is, as you might recall, a very naturalistic design. So the way that I'm sort of thinking of this is that this is my own take on naturalistic planting. It's not anybody else's, I don't know that other people would consider this to be correct. Doesn't matter, it's your own garden, you get to do what you want, right? So I'm going to have groupings of plants. Imagine big swaths of plants and many grasses incorporated into them. And then imagine that you, um, you took that whole, like imagine that was a game board and you had all these swaths of plants and then you shook it like this. This is how I'm envisioning this. I don't want a clear delineation of where one plant ends and the next starts. I want them to intermingle a little bit and sort of work their way into the next plant. So a lot of the plants, especially with the grasses, will be interplanted with something else from the get-go in terms of plants sort of emerging from the grasses but I am relying heavily on grasses for this, um, as well as perennials. Now you remember, um, most of these plants are deer resistant because I don't wanna deal with it, uh, which is why you won't see any hosses in here, even though I love hosses, I just don't feel like having to get over there and spray all the time. Um, and many of these are um, very um, friendly to pollinators and supporting um, local insects. Now, these are just the plants that I'm adding this year. There will be more in the future. There will probably be some that I divide from my garden in the future, and there will probably be um, some that don't make it. So this will, of course, like all gardens, evolve over time, but this is sort of where we're starting. So I'm gonna start with the grasses for sun, first of all. So this is um, prairie drop seed Tara. This is a shorter version of um, prairie drop seed. And this is probably the main sun grass that I'm growing. So um, that will get sort of nice and arching. I love that sort of arching habit. And there will be other perennials growing up through it. I will also have, now this doesn't look like much. This, it, this beautiful little guy, this is um, blue grama grass, uh, Betulus gracilius. Um, and this one is actually called, now you might know Blonde Ambition. This is honeycomb. This is a new variety developed by Brent Horvath. Um, Hard to, I don't know that it's necessarily out in the world too much yet. Um, it doesn't look like much here. By the way, many of the plants that I'm growing, I am growing from plugs. So I was able to get my hands on some of those um, through some wholesale opportunities. Um, and then uh, Walter's Garden sent me some plants as well. And I will tell you which ones those are when we go through. So when you see small plants, just envision this garden is not gonna look like much this year. It's a work in progress. Look at me learning to be patient. For tall grasses, this is standing ovation. This is little blue stem, a very upright form of blue stem, which is good. And then this oh, big guy down here, this is um, big blue stem and this is Blackhawks. Um, so this gets very, very dark foliage and just is a, a massive presence in the garden and, and quite tall as well. All right, on to shade grasses. Okay, on to shade grasses. Um, I have three of them. Uh, this, you guys probably recognize this. This is uh, Hacknellacloa. Um, this is the uh, Oriola. This is the Stripe Rond. Um, I would have preferred actually to have Macra, which is the solid green one. Um, was extremely hard to find in any sort of quantity that I could afford. So I went with this, but this is beautiful as well. Also, and I probably will work in some all gold and some Macra from other places in the garden as this garden develops. Um, next up is, this is a Carex. This is um, 
also known as the sedge. This is Pennsylvania, Carrick's Pennsylvania something. Um, anyways, this is Pennsylvania sedge. Uh, this is a great little kind of feathery, sort of gets sort of little mounds. Um, is great for growing underneath underneath trees, basically. And then this is another Carrick's, and this one is called Blue Zinger. And this one is actually starting to flower a little bit. So um, you can see these are plugs. You can see how many roots they have. Time to get planting. Okay, let's talk sun perennials now. Now, again, remember we're planting a mass. Also, I should mention, this seems like a lot of plants. Um, this is about a 3,400 square foot area. I don't think all 3,400 square feet are gonna get planted this year, but at least 3,000 square feet of it probably. Um, we'll just kind of see how far I can go off the periphery. So a lot of these are gonna be planted in big groupings that of course mingle with others. So um, let's start here. This is uh, Vergana Castra Virginica. This is Queen of Diamonds. This will get twice quite tall and has a pink kind of spiky flower that comes out. I'm envisioning this coming up through probably that um, Tara Prairie Drop Seed. Uh, I just think this will be beautiful sort of emerging out of a, out of a grass. Next up, we got a salvia, the ultimate in deer resistant plants, you guys. Uh, it is great to grow salvias because hardly anything really bothers them and they're great for pollinators. So. As you probably know, there are a million, maybe not a million, there are a lot of really great perennial salvias on the market, so it was difficult to pick. I ended up going with Caradonna, which is kind of a classic choice. It's a very purple bloom. Um, I like Caradonna a lot because it's extremely upright and it has a very low tendency to open up in the middle. It tends to, you know, a lot of salvias will do that flop thing in the middle. Caradonna tends to stay pretty tight. Um, there's a lot of newer varieties out there that I think are probably really good too, but Caradonna is, is sort of a, a classic and it has these great dark stems. Um, so I think it looks pretty even here um, when it's thinking about blooming. This is Penstemon Blackbeard. Now, this was a plant that I, um, that Walter's Garden sent me. They sent it bare root and I put them out in pots and look at how good that is looking. Unbelievable plants. Anyway, um, beautiful dark foliage. Again, kind of a upright habit with sort of um, um, pretty purpley spikes, a little taller, not spikes, but flowers held up on spikes. And it looks really good. The seeds look really good too. Uh, this is Statues. Now, Statues is also known as Betany, and this particular one is called Summer Crush. Um, again, there's a lot of great statues out there, but this is the one I went with. Now, if you guys are familiar with lamb's ear, that's a type of statues as well. So this is obviously not that, but same kind of habit, sort of. Um, so this will play a big role. Um, again, really friendly to pollinators. I'm sure you guys recognize this plant, although it's probably smaller than you usually have seen. Uh, this is Cat's Pajama Nepeta. I love Nepeta. It is one of the plants that I will always have in my garden. I think it is so useful. Um, and I particularly am liking cat's pajamas. Now it's quite a bit smaller than many other Nepetas, so it's really great for the front, but it just gets covered in flowers. And with all Nepetas, once it's done blooming, you go in there and you cut it back and the whole thing will reflush. And you should get at least two, um, two bloomings out of a Nepeta. I can sometimes push it to three. This is another, none of these plants look that exciting when you see them in the plugs, but this is another plant that is on my must have list. This is ladies mantle. Um, I would, this one is, is thriller. I don't, I, I don't actually know what ladies mantle I have in my garden now. It was a pass along plant. So I don't know if it was a cultivar or not, but um, I think ladies mantle, first of all, ladies mantle is a beautiful plant with these gorgeous leaves and the water kind of collects in little droplets on them. It puts up these beautiful chartreuse flowers that are great for bouquets. When those flowers are done, you can either cut just the flowers back or cut the entire plant back. Again, you'll get a big, nice reflush of growth. And this is extremely adaptable. We'll grow in anything from full sun to part shade and seems to do just fine. Um, and then this, this really doesn't look like anything. This is um, Pignanthemum muticum. Um, Blunt Mountain Mint. I saw this at the Lurie Garden and I had to have it. And when you see it growing, it looks kind of like nothing like what it looks like here. Um, it ends up getting a silvery cast to the foliage. It does run around. I planted some last year and I'm shocked 
how far it went already in one year. So be warned, this guy will run around. Give it some space to run. I think it's well worth growing. Just have to give it some space to run. Um, Blunt Mountain Mint is the common name, if I didn't say that. And this is a pollinator magnet. They go nuts for this. And then this guy is um, Leatrice, Blazing Star. I don't know if you pronounce that Leatrice or Leatrice, but either way, you guys know what I'm talking about. Blazing Star. And uh, these are, I actually got all these as bulbs from Longfield Gardens and I just potted them up and they are going strong. They would like to, I mean, they are really, check out the roots. It's time to get those planted too. I can't believe how well those are growing. So um, again, spiky flower that's gonna emerge up out of other plants and add height and intermingle well. This is a late addition to the plant palette. Um, I actually saw these plants and really just grabbed a few. Uh, Golden Alexander, uh, Zinzia, Zizia. Um, it looks a lot like uh, hogweed or pigweed, um, but it has these, um, these type of flowers. I think these are, um, it has these flowers that are absolutely, um, this is what pollinators love. So it's actually blooming now, it blooms early. As you can see, it's blooming now. So this will bloom early. So this will be some nice color because nothing else is blooming here right now. So this will be some nice early color. Can you guys tell that I'm chasing the sun? I keep moving back. Speaking of moving back into shade, let's move into shade plants. Before we do that, um, I am gonna plant a Baptisia in there. This one is pink truffles. I don't actually know why I picked pink truffles, but there's so many amazing Baptisias out there. I did want something quite tall. Um, shade plants. There's a fair amount of shade in this garden as well and some is quite damp and some is dry. So that's been kind of an interesting challenge to find plants. So one of the plants that will definitely feature strongly in the damp shade portion is a stilby. Um, I actually got those bare root from Walter's Gardens and rather than potting them up I actually planted them in the tomato beds in the vegetable garden because I knew they would be out of there. I hope by the time the tomatoes are ready to go in and they're growing great there. So I will just transplant those straight from what is essentially was a nursery bed uh, into there. So there's still be visions, which is a shorter one. Um, other shade plants. Uh, this is uh, Simicifuga. Um, Actea is also, this one is um, Burnett. Um, you guys might be familiar with this. They get these big, tall spikes of kind of and they sort of flop nicely of white, um, well, these, this one will be white blooms. Um, again, another plant to grow up through some of those uh, carrots. This it doesn't look like much, but this is one of my favorite plants. I love Thalictrums, um, also known as meadow rue. This one is called Ellen. It gets super tall, like seven feet tall. And I could only get my hands on two of these. If I could have gotten more, I would have planted way more of these. And I will hope to add more in the future. Um, I adore this plant. You can tell I'm going for some height here. So I spend so much time in other parts of the garden looking for compact plants so as to not overwhelm a space that I was craving a place where I could grow taller things. Um, look at this beauty. This is, uh, this is from Walters. This is Hucarella Red Rover. Um, just lovely. You know, I would describe this color as a sort of peachy red actually. Um, it's interesting to me that as of right now, without any flowers or anything, the shade plants are far more colorful than the, um, than the sun plants. Speaking of col colorful, how about this guy? One of my favorite sun plants and a lot of other people's too. This is Aurelia Sun King. This is, it looks like a shrub by the time it gets going, but it's a perennial and is actually the perennial of the year. Such a good doer, um, far easier to get. I have it in other places in my garden. It's much easier to get now than it used to be talk about lighting up shade. Now it will go a little, um, it will go a little greener later in the season. And if it gets, um, it's a little lighter in more sun, but it is a shade plant. So it won't hold this super bright, bright color all season, but it still is a bright light in the shade. And then this is another one from Walters. I didn't want to pull one out because isn't it beautiful looking together? This is a Japanese painted fern called Crested Surf. And it's called Crested Surf because it's got these little um, double ends on it. So it gets this kind of frilly end. So um, this is going to be such a 
star in the garden. Anytime you combine this sort of light white silver color you just brighten up and there's two ways to brighten up shade one is with something that's super bright and chartreuse and one is with white or silver foliage um, so i can't wait to get those in the ground too now there are other plants that are going in here that believe it or not i don't actually have yet one of them is um, a sangisorba called lilac squirrel uh, I'm just getting into Sangisorbas. I think they're really neat. They're up, Burnett is the common name for those. Lilac squirrel gets these big sort of fluffy, lavender colored. They look like Muppet flowers, actually. I hope it does well so I can show you these Muppet flowers. That's my word for it. Uh, I'm also getting Geranium Macorrhizum Bevins, Bevins variety. Uh, you guys probably know I talk about Geranium Macorrhizum all the time it is such a good doer another one of my must-have plants because you put it in the ground it grows in dry shade wet shade full it grow basically anywhere you put it it will grow there and i do nothing to it and when i say i do nothing to it i mean i don't even cut it back it's semi evergreen here it just flushes back out it gets beautiful fall color so basically you plant it you get established and then you never have to touch it again unless you want to divide it which i do you don't need to divide it but when you want to divide it you can i also have this one i actually grew this from seed this is echinacea pallida pale purple cone flower these are the the cone flowers that have the downward facing petals that actually look um, kind of like a badminton birdie um, so easy to grow from seed, I had no idea. So um, all those years I've been buying plants, I could have been doing this, and I think I'll plant more of those. Lots of those, as well as I don't have this one yet, but um, uh, Calamintha Montrose White is coming, and those create these sort of clouds, ethereal clouds of white flowers, low-growing. Um, Asclepes tuberosa, butterfly weed, they get those bright orange flowers on them. That'll be a nice bright pop amongst us. I would say a, a semi-subdued plant palette here. And then I do have a few biennials going in there or self-seeders going in there. So uh, Angelica gigas, I grow that in one place in my garden. It seeds everywhere. It's okay with me. I just pull out the ones I don't want. Um, I dug up several of those and potted those on so that'd be easy to transplant them. I will put those in there. I also have bronze fennel which I grew from seed. The rabbits ate some of them, but I think we're going to be okay. And some foxglove. I also grew some, some rusty foxglove. And I had a terrible time growing foxglove this year. I've been successful with it, growing it from seed in the past. For, the, for some reason this year, big disaster. So um, there will be some foxglove in there. We'll see how well it does because they're all about like this big right now. So I don't know. Those will get added in last. So there were supposed to be a lot more trees and shrubs in this plant. I do have a Cornelian cherry dogwood, Cornus moss, that we've already planted there. It's a really beautiful tree. And I've got a blue shag uh, pine that's going to go in there. But I had thought there was going to be a lot more trees and shrubs. And there may be in the future. It's just that this year I decided to focus on getting these perennials established. And then if we need those trees, I will add those in uh, in the future when there's a little bit more budget available. Okay, so now let me give you an update of what's been happening in this space. Suffice to say, I did not think that by June, I would have planted literally nothing except for one single tree. So like all projects, there have been some bumps in the road. So we got some soil delivered because I wanted to, as you remember, I wanted to fill in this whole area so we didn't go down. I mean, this was quite a ways down. So I wanted to fill this in a bit and also there were some weed problems and so my plan was I had burned some weeds and then I smothered them out with, I was going to smother them with cardboard, put some soil on top, plant into that soil, the cardboard dissolves over time, everything's good. Well, we got 10 yards of soil delivered. I took one look at it, I said, nuh-uh, not enough. So I called them up, I said, can you please bring 20 more? So they brought 20 more yards and this was a topsoil compost mix. So we had that all, and then we had some lovely neighbors who came down who have a big bucket loader thing, and they helped us, and we got that, we got 20 or 30 yards of soil done in two and a half hours with four of us working on it, so that was amazing. And everything was great, and we were pretty much ready to go, and then it rained. One week later, it rained, and if you follow me on Instagram, you probably, I essentially ended up like live blogging this 
storm, torrential rain. Um, the news said we got over seven and a half inches. I'm certain we got more than that. Um, there's been some changes from us up uphill from us and the water drained quite a bit differently than it has in the past. And basically this is all our, our creek or creek um, is all runoff. So this is all runoff from up the hill, which is farmer's fields basically, um, trying to get out to Lake Michigan and it just got overwhelmed. And so we lost a ton of soil. Um, I don't know how much we, I would, I would estimate we lost 50, about half of what we put in. So I had more soil brought, this time only five yards, just to fill in the area that was hardest hit. And I will tell you that if there is a blessing from that flood, which flooded all sorts of other stuff in our basement, although that was a problem with the sump pump, if there's a lesson from that, it was really good to see where the water flowed through this garden. Um, because it's clear to me that there is a spot in our driveway where anything that runs across our driveway is going to go right through this garden. So I need to be very cognizant of that when I choose what plants are going to go there or how we're going to manage that area. And so actually it was a blessing to see that because otherwise I might have planted things that were inappropriate for those areas. Oh, I should add that there are some things that grow naturally here that may end up staying here. So for instance, I love goldenrod. My plan was to incorporate goldenrod into this garden. Well, when I started looking at the budget, I thought, why am I buying goldenrod? This area is generally all on its own, filled with native goldenrod. I know that will come up. I know some of that will still be here. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of see where the goldenrod pops up, see how I liked it in the garden. I can always get rid of that and then buy a, a cultivar goldenrod in the future if I want. But I thought for right now, why wouldn't I just see where it's happy? So we'll see how that works in this garden as well. Again, this will be, this is an adventure for me. I've never done a garden like this. I know it doesn't look like a whole lot has happened here, but I've been pulling weeds like crazy, spreading all this soil, and I think it's about time to plant. I have drawn out the path about four times. The path, by the way, is just going to be mulch at this point. I'm not sure if that will change in the future, uh, but for now, it's mulch because mulch is easy and cheap. And if I want to change anything, it's much easier to manage a mulch path than it is with something else. The one good thing is that the bridge managed that flood just fine. Our other two bridges downstream uh, did not. They both got completely moved out of place. So this bridge managed it just fine, even though it was up to the bottom of this and running over the top in some places. But the bridge stayed where it was supposed to. Um, so that's great. So a lot of people have asked me if this garden is still happening because I haven't said anything about it. And it is. It's just happening on a bit of a different schedule than I would have otherwise thought. Now, just a quick note about the sun. It's very early in the morning here right now, so it's pretty shady right here. This side of the garden will be full sun. This side is where we get into some of those shades. Behind me is a beautiful oak tree, um, and we've got some other trees around here. So anyway, that is the update to this. Is this project happening on the schedule I would have thought? Nope, but that's this year for you, right? It's okay, these things happen. Uh, I never used to be so easygoing about that whole attitude, but I think a lot of years has gardening, have, of gardening has shown me that nothing ever goes exactly how you plan and you just have to roll with it or else you go crazy. So here's to not going crazy in your garden and we will catch you guys soon. We are gonna be planting in this soon and I will make sure to show you as things develop.